This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. December 1988. An 82-foot freighter named the Freedon sets sail for Haiti with seven crewmen, a dashing young German captain, and a beautiful 23-year-old journalist, Lisa Bishop. A few days later, the Freedon vanished without a trace. 24-year-old Adam Heck struggled with the paradox of his own affluent lifestyle and the poverty he saw in the back alleys of Beverly Hills. In 1989, he befriended a homeless person and even invited him to share his apartment. Now Adam Hecht is missing. In the final days of World War II, a fortune in gold and precious jewels was allegedly smuggled out of the infamous concentration camp at Dachau. Today, there is compelling evidence that this buried treasure still lies beneath a mountain lake in Austria. Also tonight, an update on the case of a former mental patient who disappeared after her boyfriend was murdered. Maria Armstrong is now in custody thanks to an anonymous tip received after a recent broadcast of the story. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. conception of the Caribbean is that it is a playground for tourists, a paradise for those lucky enough to live there. In actuality, the gulf between have and have-nots is dramatic. Nowhere are these contrasts more evident than in Haiti, where the average income is less than $300 per person per year. Today, the Caribbean is crisscrossed by dilapidated freighters, overloaded with miscellaneous and often stolen goods heading to this impoverished island. Smugglers also abound in the area. Guns, narcotics, and stolen merchandise are continually being transported to and from Miami. January 1989, Falcon jets from the United States Coast Guard conducted a search for an 82-foot tramp freighter named the Freedon. En route to Haiti, the steamer had been reported missing at sea the week before. Despite the Coast Guard search, the ship had apparently vanished without a trace. On board the Freedom, a derelict cargo ship of Bahamian registry, were seven Haitian crew members, a handsome young sea captain, and an attractive 23-year-old American journalism student named Lisa Bishop, on the morning of her departure, Lisa had called her parents to say goodbye. I could feel something was wrong. Mother's intuition, I guess you could call it. Lisa was to call me when she arrived. And that call never came. Known by her friends for her social conscience, Lisa wanted to write an article that would dramatize the contrast between the wealth of America and the economic devastation of Haiti. To Lisa, her voyage on the Freedon was a chance of a lifetime, even though it meant leaving her boyfriend of three years. We had a long discussion the night before she left that uh, she had to make her own decision that in life that I couldn't follow her and take care of her wherever she went. Somewhere in the Caribbean Sea between Miami and Haiti, Lisa Bishop and eight other people simply vanished. Explanations are ranged from pirates to smugglers, even to an encounter with a so-called Bermuda Triangle. This voyage into the unknown began with a chance encounter with a dashing sea captain. Atlanta, Georgia. At a nightclub owned by her boyfriend, Paul Cornwell, Lisa met a 28-year-old German national named Florian Meyer Borsch. 
Florian was a modern day gypsy, a brilliant mechanic who had briefly settled in Miami. Florian had sailed throughout the Caribbean and was a fixture of the European expatriate community. Though Florian was outwardly charismatic and charming, Lisa's parents felt appearances were deceiving. Well, when I first saw Florian's photograph, just by looking at him, I didn't think that uh, he was the type of person that Lisa would uh, have anything to do with. Florian, from what I've learned about him, is a drifter. And he's uh, sponges off of people, freeloads. Lisa, Christmas in the Caribbean. Think about it. A year after their first meeting, Florian told Lisa of an upcoming voyage from Miami to Haiti. Aware of her journalistic ambitions, he invited her to accompany him. Lisa, it's right at your fingertips. Oh, sounds wonderful. Lisa Bishop and Paul Cornwell had had a stormy three-year relationship. Paul was upset when Lisa told him that she planned to sail to Haiti with Florian. I didn't trust him with Lisa. Of course, I was concerned about Florian, you know, being a, a young guy. And she tried to tell me there was nothing to worry about, there was nothing romantic. I tried to discourage her as her parents tried to discourage her from going because they were concerned about it. I expressed my feelings about it, that I didn't want her to go or anything. And uh, Lisa was a uh, very headstrong girl when she made up her mind to do something. On the morning of December 17th, 1988, the weather was cold, the water choppy. Florian considered delaying the departure. If we don't go now, I'm not going to be able to go at all. I might as well just turn around and go home. Minutes before they left, Lisa spoke to her parents for what would be the last time. I said, don't worry, Daddy. I said, everything will be all right, you know. And the last words I had with her was I was still asking her not to go, you know. And then she talked to her mother. I never talked to her again after that. Finally at 2.30 in the afternoon, tugboats eased the Freedom through the Miami River as it headed towards open sea. What Lisa thought would be the adventure of a lifetime was just the beginning. But to those caught in the wake of the Freedom's disappearance, it was the beginning of a nightmare. The Freedom's planned route would take the ship 600 miles past the coast of Cuba to Gonaï, a small port on the western coast of Haiti. Despite the fact that there were no storms and no distress calls, the Freedon apparently never arrived. When Lisa didn't call on Christmas Day, her family became alarmed. The relatives of the people on board uh, kept calling us, asking us for information. We kept in touch with the uh, port authorities in the various ports in that mid-Caribbean area, and likewise down in Haiti. We sent several uh, search and rescue flights by Falcon jet aircraft in the most commonly traveled area, the Old Bahama Channel, which is the area between the United States and Haiti. Still, it was unsuccessful. We even sent a telegram to the uh, Cuban uh, border guards to ask them if they had any information on that vessel. However, they had no information either. Despite their sweep of the Caribbean, the Coast Guard found no trace of the Freedom. Lisa's friends and family refused to give up the search. Mrs. Bishop and I were the only people looking. We felt we were the only people looking. I mean, there were no governmental agencies that would look at all. We came to Miami hoping to maybe get some answers from some of Florian's friends or just find, you know, anything we could. We're desperate. And uh, we contacted the New Times and they sent a reporter out by the name of David Nickel. Miami, April 1989. When an underwater salvager named Bob Nyberg read the New Times article in the Freedon, he realized that he had seen the ship two weeks after it had allegedly disappeared in a completely different part of the Caribbean. I remembered that while I was working in Grand Cayman in January of that year, there'd been a boat came in. We were working underwater directly in the harbor area where the ships pulled up and tied up. When I heard the ship coming in, we came up. And as I was coming out of the water, 
We looked back and noticed the name was Freedon, F-R-E-E-D-O-N. And I made a statement to my friend that those guys need their freedom. They can't even spell the word. They were there for some time that afternoon. Next morning, the boat was gone. Nyberg saw the Freedon in Georgetown Harbor on Grand Cayman Island, over 500 miles from Haiti. Where it went after his sighting is unknown. The fact that the ship was spotted, and I feel like it did not go down, then it brought me hope that Lisa was alive and had to be held against her will in order for her not to contact us. In May of 1989, Paul Cornwell and Bob Nyberg went to Grand Cayman. There they hoped to find more information on the fate of the Freedom. After canvassing the port, they found a number of witnesses who claimed to have seen Florian around the same time that Nyberg had spotted the Freedom. Yeah, sure, I've seen him around here. What about this girl? No, honestly, I can't recall seeing her. But Though nobody could remember him. having seen Lisa, an important clue did surface. Apparently, Florian was not alone during his mysterious sojourn on Grand Cayman. Yeah, he coming with uh, another fellow, short fellow with uh, black hair. Really, with another guy? Yeah. I couldn't help feeling that I, he was right around the corner, that, that I was going to run across him any minute in one of these bars, personally. And so I was very apprehensive, very agitated, ready for anything. And it just made me look harder. Paul, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Okay. Paul returned to Atlanta and questioned a woman who had been storing Florian's personal belongings. But in this one bag, there's some letters and pictures that I thought you might want to look through. There he found a picture of the man seen with Florian in Grand Cayman. The woman gave his name as Philippe. Paul would later find out that Philippe had chartered the Freedom. The girl told me at that time that she had had a personal relationship with this guy, Philippe, and that he mentioned that he was involved in a large-scale smuggling thing, which really got me going, thinking it was a smuggling thing and that something had gone wrong and, you know, that they were, had gotten involved in something too deep that Lisa didn't know about and that she couldn't handle. I've heard how they say that uh, Gun runners or dope dealers that hijack it, kill everybody on board, and uh, use the ship one time to make a run or something. I've heard about how the weather can change in a heartbeat out there, and a ship can go under, and they claim that uh, nothing will ever be found. I've heard all the stories and all the rumors. It's just a gnawing hurt that you have that you don't know. Uh, how she is, where she is, or what, you know. But you always got hope. Well, the heartache will never go away. Perhaps someone out in the audience might be able to tell us the whereabouts of Florian. And that would be the key to find Lisa, or what has happened to Lisa. I feel that if Florian is out there, eventually, I'll find out about it, and I'll locate him. Authorities believe that Florian Meyer Bursch is the key to the mystery of the freedom. He is 30 years old, six feet two, with blonde hair and blue eyes. Known for his mechanical ability, Bursch may be working in a related area. Today, Lisa Bishop would be 25 years old. She's five feet two inches in height, with blonde hair and brown eyes. Rumors persist that the Freedon with a telltale bent mast continues to roam the Caribbean under a different name. These are the only known pictures of how the boat looked before its disappearance. Last November, we examined the case of 25-year-old Maria Armstrong, in 1984, Maria was diagnosed as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, a physical disease of the brain. In June of 1988, Maria moved from her home in New Jersey to Mesa, Arizona to live with her childhood sweetheart, 29-year-old Robert Ron Argenti. Argenti was aware of Maria's condition, but felt that he could somehow help her to overcome her illness. 
we were concerned because we did hear that she was in a mental institution and we knew she was on drugs back back east um so we were kind of concerned about it but you know they were holding hands kissing they were like a couple <laughs> for the first few weeks maria seemed happy at mesa she seemed to blossom under ron's loving attention but Maria soon began behaving erratically, and she turned violent Maria. towards Ron. Maria, calm down. Listen, calm down. Just leave me alone! They told me about you! Okay. They told me All right! I would talk to Ron on the phone, and I would tell him, send her home. I don't want to do that. I want to help her, he would say. I said, but you can't help her. It's obvious you can't help her. She needs more than you to help her. She needs psychiatric care. On November 14th, Ron Argenti's body was discovered in his living room. He had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer while he slept on the couch. Four days later, Maria Armstrong was seen hitchhiking 260 miles north of Mesa, Arizona. This was the last reported sighting of Maria Armstrong until our broadcast. Update. Maria Armstrong has been captured. Shortly after this story aired, the FBI received a call from one of our viewers with information regarding Armstrong's whereabouts. We received a telephone call from an unidentified caller that Marie Armstrong had been living in the Memphis, Tennessee area, and that she was going to be at the airport on August 3rd of this year. Uh, the FBI subsequently went to the airport and were able to identify her, and they did place her under arrest. Armstrong had changed her appearance by dyeing her hair blonde. Two weeks later, she was returned to Arizona to face a charge of first-degree murder. Beverly Hills, California, with an average yearly income of $75,000 per household, this is one of the nation's wealthiest communities. Its streets, stores, and sidewalks are filled with glamorous people living their lives in luxury. But there is another side to Beverly Hills. As with so much of the nation, there is a growing population of homeless who pass through and even live on its affluent streets. In the winter of 1989, at least one of these homeless individuals found an unlikely benefactor in 24-year-old Adam Hecht. The son of an Academy Award-winning producer, Adam was born into Beverly Hills luxury. He spent his childhood in an insulated world bordered by movie stars, mansions, and privilege. After graduating from Beverly Hills High, Adam earned his living giving tennis lessons. All who knew him remembered a bright, independent, and friendly young man. All that began to change on the morning of January the 10th, 1989, when Adam and his brother Harold went to breakfast at a local delicatessen. I couldn't believe it. Before Gibson hit the homer. Yeah. In front of the restaurant, they encountered a street person, apparently blind in one eye. Double the orange juice. A few minutes later, Adam left the table and went back outside. Excuse me, just for... Adam said, excuse me. He went outside and started talking to this person. And I could see through the uh, blinds, and I couldn't understand it. And was quite surprised. I didn't understand uh, what was his reason for being out there. What was all that about? Oh, no. Adam came back in, started talking. I mentioned it briefly. I said, what, what are you doing out there? He said, oh, nothing, really. So we went on, had our breakfast. When we finished, right, we left. I went to my car. Listen, I've got a 10 o'clock at Mulholland, but uh, I'll catch up with you later. I'm going to make a quick call, all right? All right. All right. Bye. And just before I got in my car, I looked back, and he was talking to this person. I was very surprised. Yeah. That was the first time he met what we know now is Tony. There are things that, that, you, that you can't see. 
Yeah, well, I, I feel like I, I, I should help you. Within a few weeks of their first meeting, Adam invited Tony to move into his apartment. Through his new friend, Adam was exposed to a lifestyle that was as far away from his experience as night from day. It seemed to strike a chord in Adam, for according to his brother Harold, he had become disillusioned with his pampered life. His family fears that what started out as a gesture of a good Samaritan may have escalated into a nightmare. Today, Adam Hecht is missing. Tony, this is where my mom lives. Soon after Tony moved in, Adam brought his new roommate to his mother's house for dinner. She was surprised that her son would shelter a street person. I thought, my goodness, that's strange, you know, but knowing Adam the way he is, I could understand it until I met Tony, you know. I really understood it. I thought, oh, my goodness, it's so nice that he wants to help him, you know. Oh, what a su surprise. Who's this? Mom, this is Tony. Tony, this is my mother. Well, why don't you come in? When I saw Tony and how he talked, and my God, the smell. It was unbelievable. And wow, it was scary. It was really scary. During the meal, Tony began to wave his hands over his food as if he were blessing it. Adam, what's going on with him? <laughs> oh, well, that's just the way Tony is. And it's hard to understand right at first, but once you get to know him from, from the inside out, he's really a fantastic guy. Adam His was very, life, um, very much um, last two wanting to talk about Tony, and so uh, they seemed to have a good relationship. Adam seemed to understand Tony, you know, and, uh, and I was led to believe that Tony was um, a really being very kind to Adam as far as, you know, helping him grow up as a person. Mature, that's what he said to me. He's helping me mature as a person. Adam, at the beginning, he was an elite, preppy businessman, you know, drove a great car, taught tennis. And then you met Tony, and it, I mean, it, it just all changed, and you became a mystical person, and I just, I didn't know him anymore. Part of me was torn, because I felt for, for what he was trying to do. I mean, it was a, it was a very noble thing. With Tony by his side, Adam began to visit Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles and often stayed out on the streets at night. I know that when Adam sets his mind to something, he really goes wholeheartedly into any type of project. Hey, Tony, I got some uh, food and stuff in the back of my car. Maybe help me pass it out? OK, cool, let's go. His involvement with street people uh, increased when he met Tony. I think started to understand their problems. There's gonna be some food coming up. I'll make sure you guys get some food. Yeah. All these things you have, Adam. It's not what counts. What counts is with society. Tony and Adam would also share in strange mystical strange. rites of Tony's devising. You have to let go. In one of these rituals, Adam burned his hand severely. You embrace the things. Inside of you. All I know is when I saw it, I said, my God, Adam, what happened to you? He said, oh, he said, you know, he said, I was testing a test of endurance. He said, Tony told me we were experimenting that see how it would make me stronger. June 10th, 1989. Harold had not heard from his brother for several days. Concerned, Adam, he went to there? Adam's apartment. Adam? Adam? Oh, gosh, Tony, is Adam here? My brother was not there. His car was not there. Have you seen him? And I tried to get in. Listen, let, let me. Uh, I said, "Where's Adam?" I said, "Where is he gone?" And in his strange, strange way, he did not answer that question or seem to really know. He is. Everybody's really worried. Will you let me in? Let me in. It's really hot in here. Let me in the door. A few days later, Adam's mother also went to his apartment. As I'm walking back down the corridor, he's following me, and he's, he kiss. says, give us a kiss. Us a but kiss. starts to put his arms around me, and Get I was, oh, it was the most scary thing. What's wrong? Are you afraid of me? I just want to know where my son is. Where my son is? Where is he? Well, I want to 
No. I'm your son. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm your son. On the advice of a private investigator, the family contact of the Beverly Hills Police filed a missing persons report and began to arrange for Tony's eviction. Right up the stairs. Right up the stairs. Why don't you just stay right there for a second? Okay, what I need you guys to do is go around the back, watch for the second story. I'm looking at a big guy. Just make sure he doesn't bail out. Okay, partner, I'm talking top of the stairs. On July 9th, the family, accompanied by the investigator, stood by as Tony was forcibly evicted from Adam's apartment. Come on out here. Put your hands up behind your head. And this is my friend's Come house. Come on, you know the routine. Come on. Reach up. Take your hands down. I want you to walk down to the bottom of the stairs. Do you understand? Yeah. All right. Let's go. During the eviction, Tony made no effort to avoid police. Local detectives interviewed Tony and came to the conclusion that he had not been involved in Adam's disappearance. Tony claimed to have no knowledge of his whereabouts. I can't to this day understand why they didn't interrogate him, you know, Paul, because he obviously knows much more than what they're letting on. I would love to have some sodium pentothal or whatever they do and just uh, try and get a truth serum and have him talk, because I couldn't get two sentences out of this man. He was, he was just so strange, you know? One month after Adam's disappearance, his car was found abandoned on a Beverly Hills side street. On the windshield were several parking tickets. Inside, the keys were still in the ignition, and police found Adam's wallet, credit cards, and $600 in cash and checks. No other trace of Adam was found. We wish we knew specifically what happened to Adam Hecht. Uh, apparently, he, in the past, occasionally had gone away for a, a few days at a time, but always had returned. And whether he did this time and just decided not to return, we don't know. He had a very solid business, very active with a number of different people on a number of different levels. For him just to disappear does not fit his character. While there are some suspicious circumstances as far as finding the car and finding his property in the car, normally you'd take with that with you if you were going to leave. We have no real evidence of any foul play or any criminal involvement, so we're not handling it as a, a crime, strictly as a, a missing person case. Does Tony know more about Adam's disappearance than he is telling? Did someone from Adam's brief time on the street decide to violently reappear? Yes. Or did Adam reject his former life of luxury and just lose himself among the homeless? We all want him back. He wants so much for our family to understand, to understand his thoughts. And what I would like him to know is that it's very hard for someone like my mother to, um, to listen to what he has to, had to say and, and take it in, because everyone has limits to, to their understanding. And his was so vast, his spiritual knowledge, that it was difficult for us to take it in. What can I say? I just, I just love him, and I just want him to come home. I miss him with all my heart. It's not a complete family without him. And I would try and understand whatever he was thinking, and I would not be mad at him in any way. I just want him to just come home because he's truly loved by all of us, and many uh, other people, too. Adam Arthur Hecht is 5 feet 11 inches in height and weighs 160 pounds. His eyes are hazel and his hair is black. Today, he would be 25 years old and may be wearing a beard. Adam also may still have the burn scar on his right hand. Next, the story of stolen Nazi treasure, allegedly buried in Austria near the end of World War II. Today, it could be worth over $50 million. April 1945, the final days of the Nazi Empire. Despite desperate measures taken by the defenders, 
combined Allied forces closed in on the last pockets of German resistance. The end of the war in Europe was near. As the Allies advanced into Germany, they discovered treasures plundered from the Nazis' former conquests, carefully hidden away in caves and vaults. In the months following the German surrender, billions of dollars in riches were uncovered, including these gold bars found in an abandoned salt mine by U.S. soldiers. While the bulk of these stolen treasures was recovered, billions of dollars still remain unaccounted for. There was, of course, more shocking evidence of Nazi barbarism. Buchenwald, Mathausen, Dachau, names that would come to symbolize man's inhumanity to man. And through the gates of Dachau, one multi-million dollar Nazi treasure allegedly passed. Tonight we will investigate the story of this treasure as told to us by Dr. Edward Greger. He is convinced it was buried on the shores of a small Austrian lake in the spring of 1945, where it remains today. We have uncovered dramatic evidence that supports Dr. Greger's story, a story first told by an Austrian physician named Wilhelm Gross. After the war, Dr. Gross had treated imprisoned Nazi war criminals. An SS officer who had been condemned to death told Gross of the location of the buried treasure. In 1952, Dr. Gross shared the story with Edward Greger, who was then a U.S. Army officer stationed in Austria. It started at the concentration camp of Dachau, gold and treasure that was accumulated from the prisoners that had brought in there who were executed and cremated. The concentration camp of Dachau has been preserved as a memorial. This recreation was filmed there. According to Dr. Gross, the commandant of Dachau and three of the assistants loaded the treasure into four boxes, which were probably ammunition boxes, according to the size. These boxes were filled with jewelry, rare stamps, and gold bars, some of it processed from the gold fillings of concentration camp victims. Today, their contents would be worth at least $50 million. Dr. Gross's informant claimed to be one of four SS officers who conspired to smuggle this treasure out of Dachau. Their route allegedly took them from the outskirts of Munich into Austria through the Arlberg Pass toward the small town of Brot. Near Brot was a pristine mountain lake called the Lunar Zee. This lake, located on the Swiss border, was their ultimate destination. Allied armies had not yet reached this isolated region, and the men believed their loot would be safe there. After burying the treasure, the men planned to escape across the Swiss border. After several days, the men finally arrived at the Lunar Zee. The only structure in the area was a small hut Dr. Gross stated that the officers buried the treasure exactly halfway between this hut and a brook across the lake. They then said their farewells and went their separate ways, planning one day to return. Three of them left and headed into Switzerland. The fourth person went back down into the valley return to his family. According to Dr. Gross, this fourth officer was captured and while awaiting execution revealed his secret. The officer's three companions were never seen again. Gregor believed Dr. Gross's story and agreed to help search for the treasure. But before they could mount an expedition, Dr. Gross mysteriously disappeared in 1956, a dam was constructed on the Lunar Zay and submerged the treasure's alleged location under 75 feet of water. 34 years passed. In the summer of 1990, enough water had been let out of the dam to return the lake to its original depth. This, coupled with a severe drought, had brought the water level to an all-time low. Get your pick out of the way there, and I'll go in there and look. 
it's not getting any stronger as we're going down deeper. Armed with information culled from Dr. Gross's personal papers, Edward Greger finally went to the Lunar Zay. Well, it's already off the meter, though, so it's as strong as it can be. I think it's something in the rocks. Gregor and an associate pinpointed the treasure's location by using coordinates from a map given him by Dr. Gross. But despite a thorough search, he was unable to find the treasure. Where is the Lunar Zay treasure? Had the other three Nazi officers dug it up? Edward Gregor feels this is unlikely. By the time it would have been safe to return, the treasure would have been submerged. Or could Dr. Gross's story be just that, a story? Documents brought to light at a 1946 war crimes trial indicate that such a treasure did exist. I had discovered some evidence in the archives, specifically uh, an interrogation statement from uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Joseph Gerlin. Joseph Gerlin was tried, convicted, and executed for atrocities committed while he was a subcommandant of Dachau. According to his testimony and the statements from four other sources, the head commandant of Dachau had been involved in a conspiracy to smuggle a treasure from inside the camp. This officer's name was Frederick Fighter. One witness said that he saw Fighter have a truck loaded being loaded with valuables out of the cash storage areas. According to some other testimony, Fighter was seen leaving the camp in those vehicles. Later on, he was also seen by other SS personnel heading towards the Swiss border. Also, Gerilyn testified that other camp personnel had assisted in burying this treasure and that approximately five million in gold rice marks was taken in valuables. Joseph Gerlin went to his grave, never revealing any more about the treasure. Edward Greger believes that Gerlin was one of the four men who buried the Lunar Zay treasure, and perhaps he was Dr. Gross's mysterious informant. Today, if it exists, this multi-million dollar treasure is underwater, but Edward Greger will return again when the water level has lowered. He believes that if found, the proceeds of the Lunar Zay treasure should be used to provide medical care for needy individuals, a fitting use for wealth stolen under such grim circumstances. Next, the story of a bold prison break and two unlikely lovers escaped convict and his female guard. I'd like for her to come home and tell me why she did it. And to turn herself in. Because I don't want her to get hurt. I do love her. Just I'm confused right now. You have just heard the plea of Leslie Beeman, a daughter in anguish over the disappearance of her mother, Kay. Is Kay Beeman a victim or a criminal? Leslie holds out hope that Kay is innocent, but no matter what, she wants her mother to come home. Kay Beeman was divorced when her son and daughter were nearly grown. For 10 years, she had worked as a matron and corrections officer at the Allegheny County Detention Center for Men and Women in Cumberland, Maryland. August 29, 1990, just seven weeks ago, Kay Beeman was on duty in the prison control center with another female officer, Michelle Puderbau. Michelle, I'll take this round. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. At 2.12 a.m., Kay left the control center to conduct a routine check of the cell block. All inmates were behind bars except one low-security prisoner who was working in an adjacent room. Everything seemed normal, but within minutes, the 
calm of an uneventful night shift would be dramatically turned upside down. Come on, lady, come on with us. What are you doing in here? I said, come on! How serious this is. You know how serious I am? I ain't got time to listen to this. Barnes is coming down with Beam and he's got a weapon. The escaped inmate is Edgar Kearns, a maximum security prisoner. You don't want you to try anything and somebody's getting hurt. I didn't know what they were going to do. And I saw the bathroom door was standing ajar, so I just darted out and ran. At first, I felt a relief that I was, at least for the moment, safe. But then I was thinking, but my God, you know, what are you going to do here? And they have Kay. What are they going to do to her? It appeared that Kay Beeman had been taken hostage by James Barnes, Edgar Kern's cellmate. I heard the buttons click Come on, Eddie, hurry and up. the controls. And so oh, I, I thought, well, they're, they're gone. Two days later, Kay Beeman telephoned her daughter, Leslie. It was about a quarter after five in the morning, and she called Collect. And she told me she was all right, and that she loved me, and she missed me, and not to worry about her, that she was all right. And she said, she told me, she goes, I went with them. We're out of here. Three days after the breakout, James Barnes was apprehended. He told authorities that Kay Beeman's car was used in the getaway. He also claimed that Kay Beeman had helped plan the escape because she was in love with Edgar Kearns. Edgar Kearns had been convicted of theft and forgery in West Virginia. He was awaiting sentencing in Maryland for passing bad checks. James Barnes said that Kay Beeman and Edgar Kearns had been romantically involved for three months. At the prison, the two had long, soulful conversations. I haven't complained, have I? Mr. Barnes told us that she would spend sometimes a uh, half an hour, 40 minutes in the maximum security area just talking to Kearns. So there definitely was a relationship there. Sleeping, as usual. I guess you maybe fall in love with somebody and you do some strange things, but uh, Kay's pretty well lost about everything that she ever had over this one incident. Once there was almost a certainty in my mind of what had happened, uh, I just, I felt so betrayed. I felt, I just couldn't believe she could do that. I want to know why she did it. And I'd like to have her home so she can explain it to me. She hurt me, and um, I don't know how to feel about it or about her. It just hurts a lot. Sandra K. Beeman is 46 years old and 5 feet 3 inches tall. She weighs 170 pounds. She has experience as a beautician and may have changed her hairstyle and color. Edgar Eugene Kearns is 30 years old and 5 feet 9 inches tall. He weighs 200 pounds. His hair color and style may have been altered by Kay. On his right forearm, he has a tattoo of a panther and heart tattoos on both biceps. Up to it. Just six hours after our broadcast, Sandra K. Beam and Edgar Kearns were captured in Canada. On September 10th, 12 days after the escape, Beeman and Kearns checked into the Beach Motor Motel in Hamilton, Canada. They registered as husband and wife under the assumed names Fred and Sandy Smith. I was watching TV, and all of a sudden, this lady's picture come on. So I called my wife in. She was out in the kitchen ironing, and I said, do you recognize this lady? And she said, yes, she's the lady that's living in room 12. And by this time, the gentleman come on. And I said, uh-oh, he also lives in there. So I reached over immediately and picked up the phone and called the police. When we got to the Beach Motor Hotel, uh, the information from the Mitchells was to the effect that they hadn't left their room and it wasn't their policy to leave the room during the evening. We were convinced they were still inside the room. 
The officers at the emergency response unit, which is equivalent to the SWAT team, forced the door open. The room was found to be vacated. A witness later told authorities that he had seen the fugitive couple getting into a taxi cab earlier that evening. We were able to determine the name of the cab, and a check with the cab company revealed the driver. I picked them up at the beach strip, and that um, just up from the motel, and uh, they, I asked them where they were going, and they said uh, the Red Rose Motel. When we got to the motel, the cab driver said he had taken them. One of our officers was able to determine from the office register at that location that they had, in fact, booked in and that Kearns, in fact, had used his right name. A few minutes later, the emergency response unit moved in. Okay, let's go. Three or four officers of the emergency response unit approached the front door of the motel room. It was at that point that someone from the inside of the room looked out through the drapes. The officers then forced open the door, entered the room. Kearns, he was forced to the floor of the motel room and held in a position of safety. The female in the room was in the bed and her hands were handcuffed above her head to the headboard. At that point there, both persons were arrested. Kearns was removed by my partner and myself and transported to Central Station. He wanted to know how we had learned of his whereabouts. We asked him if he had ever seen the program before. He said yes, he had. We told him that he was on it tonight. He was astounded. Join us next week for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.